Okay, we've got people, we have guests, we have everything we need, so let's begin. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm really glad to see all of you here today. We have a couple of terrific guests on a very, very important topic and a lot to discuss. Okay, it's a little hot in here, so I'm going to go back to my business casual here. Um, for, the, for the past, oh gosh, at least three years on the Future Trends Forum, we've been examining, among other things, two crucial topics. One is the question of financing higher education, especially in the United States, how we do it with a massive amount of student debt. At the same time, we've been exploring race, racism, and anti-racism, and how that shapes not just society, but higher education. Today, I'd like to connect those two streams. I'd like to have us look into what it means to be black in this country and to take out student loans. How is that experience different from the experience of students of other races? What does higher education do to make that worse? And what can we do to improve it, to reform this and to make it better? In order to do that, we have two wonderful scholars who have just recently published a new book. If you look in the bottom left of your screen, you should see a little button that says, A Dream Defaulted. That's the title. And let me bring each of our scholars up on stage. Uh, first of all, let me find Professor Otto and let me add her to the top of our screen. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Good to see you. And I, I'm saying afternoon. I, I know you're on the road. Are, which time zone are you in? Oh, no, I'm still on the East Coast. I'm in, <laughs> I'm not, okay. yes, yeah, yeah. It's two o'clock okay. here. A little after two o'clock here. Yes. Oh, great, great. Well, I'm so glad to see you. Um, President Otto, we have, uh, I'm sorry, Professor Otto, we have, we have all these ways of introducing ourselves in the academy. But the one that we do here is forward looking. I'd like to ask, what are you going to be working on for the next year or so? What are the big projects? What are the big ideas for you? Yeah, so I have uh, several new or uh, fairly new projects that I'm working on, um, all kind of still related to this topic on uh, higher education. Um, I'm working with a team that's looking at system wide data here in North Carolina, kind of mm. trying to do like a demographic landscaping of their financial aid and student debt profiles. Mm. So really, um, like, you know, uh, comprehensive data to kind of uh, figure out what's been going on over the last few years here. Um, I'm also still doing some work on social mobility um, or higher education and um, college degrees uh, as, a, as a mechanism of social mobility for uh, poor middle-class Black Americans. And I'm also working on a, on, a, on a paper more recently on how student debt um, might be thought of as a form of reparations and whether or not we can make that claim. So, uh, Whoa. Wow. Well, that's all amazing. I, I would love to see that paper whenever, whenever it gets out. That sounds great. What a yeah. great idea. Well, welcome. Uh, and let me add your colleague to the stage as well. Uh, I don't want to leave you know him completely out of everything. No, no, no. I can't leave Jason out. <laughs> now, if he's in New Hampshire, I lived in Vermont long enough to know that I don't have to be nice to anyone from New Hampshire. But let me see if I can be polite at least. You know, and, and let's say how that'll work. Professor Hool, welcome, welcome. Hey, how are you? Good to see you, good to see you. Uh, here, let me actually uh, make things a little little fancier. Let me uh, make the video a little sharper here. Professor Hool, um, you heard our, our unique method of introducing ourselves. What are you gonna be working on for the next year? Yeah, so I think like a lot of us who just lived through the last three years, um, I'm really interested in understanding how the COVID-19 pandemic has either exacerbated all the problems we care about as social scientists or perhaps maybe made some of them better because historically we saw you know direct aid to families be higher than it has been in previous recessions um, and particularly given my interest um, in debt more broadly than just student debt we're really interested in how this has impacted um, borrowing um, for rich folks for poor folks and particularly the kind of borrowing we tend to worry about that is like really high interest loans that we think of as being predatory like payday loans and those sorts of things so it's really understand understanding the landscape of debt and inequality kind of during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. People usually say that the pandemic exacerbated economic inequality. Um, do, do you think that idea still holds up from what data you've seen? Um, I think it does in some ways. Like, you know, we, we saw like right what looked like a very K-shaped recovery. So it was really working 
class folks um, and folks of color who were in service sector in industries that were emergency workers. It was also these folks who were more likely to get laid off. And, you know, quite frankly, folks like me who were able to keep their job and just do it remotely, even though it was like mildly uncomfortable, um, mm -hmm. we were pretty secure. And in fact, you know, the upper middle class made a lot of money in the stock market boom that came after um, the COVID-19 pandemic and made a lot in savings. Um, but we all, what we also saw was kind of this grand experiment that I think a lot of progressives and liberals have been wanting to see, that is an expansion of welfare benefits. We saw the kind of the most generous unemployment benefits we've seen in decades, the most uh, sort of the generous aid to most generous aid to children that we've seen. So child poverty, for example, was I think close to cut in half. That statistic is mm. slightly wrong during the pandemic. So there's ways in which it's sort of like a little bit of both. And so that's why it sort of merits investigation because I don't think we have a good handle on this yet. Oh, that's a good problem. Thank you. That's a, that's a good answer to uh, like, my uh, clumsy question, and uh, I look forward to seeing your results. Um, thank you very much. Um, friends, now that we have our two guests on stage, um, what I'm going to do is ask them a couple of really basic introductory questions to get things going. Um, but then I want to get out of the way and make this space available for your questions and your comments. So as Professor Zado and Hul describe their book, and as you reflect on what you've read of it or read about it, and when you, as you respond to their words, think of the questions you'd like to ask. Uh, I can promise we'll all be as kind as possible, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts together. So just, just to begin with, in, in the course of your research in creating this important book, what are the main differences that you see that distinguish Black student debt from everybody else's debt and student debt? How is the Black student debt experience different from those of Latinos, from uh, whites, from um, Hispanics uh, and from Asians. Should I start, Jason? <laughs> okay, I can start, and then you just uh, fill in where I miss. Uh, miss. Um, so, what we really saw, and I think um, some of our earliest work um, speaks directly to this, was that Black borrowers, on average, were accumulating more student debt. So they were they were taking out more debt, accumulating more debt, and struggling to repay it or have highest rates, higher rates of loan default and delinquency. So really one of the strongest predictors of student debt um, was the racial categorization of the borrower. Um, mm -hmm. uh, second to that was usually the institutional, uh, institutional uh, sector that the student went to. So if they went mm -hmm. to a for-profit college or um, so on, or for, for example. So um, I, like I said, I, some of our earliest work was really um, uh, quantifying that disparity, that the student debt disparity that Black borrowers have. And when we compare it to other groups, you know, whites or Latinos, um, uh, it was always, uh, black, the Black numbers were always the highest or the most extreme. So yeah. our book really is focused on Black borrowers because they are the, uh, they had the highest and the most extreme levels. Um, so I'll start to stop there and let Jason go, go from there. <laughs> Yeah, so I think Fenneba did a great job sort of telling us sort of like the, the nitty gritty of why we focus on black borrowers in particular. It's, um, you know, as a sociologist, I think of like, if we if we want to really, we want to zoom in on the social situations or the situations in which there is great pain. And that is quite frankly, where we see the greatest pain. Um, but I think I would back up also and just to kind of give a more 30,000 foot picture is that you know, when we, it, we we do better talking about the student debt crisis today than we did, say, five years ago. So in some ways, our book's a, a little bit too late. Um, but, you know, we often would hear debates about, is student debt really an accumulation crisis or is it a repayment crisis? So if we look at student yeah. debt accumulation, we might see stories in the New York Times or the Chicago uh, newspapers or what have you about, like, you know, these baristas that have 120 k in student debt and they're struggling to repay it. But in reality, that's usually not super representative of the people with high amounts of debt. People with high amounts of debt are people like people with PhDs, people with medical degrees, people with law degrees who end up in really high paying professions where they pay it down pretty easily. And so a lot of folks have said, like, we shouldn't we should ignore maybe the eye popping numbers of student debt. Instead, they would say what we need to focus on is the fact that there is a student debt repayment crisis. And these look very different, such that. The folks on average who have $120,000 in debt are not your baristas, they're your lawyers and doctors, and they're not defaulting on their loans. They're not having a hard time to, uh, paying their loans. Instead, the people who are defaulting oftentimes have small amounts of loans, $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, and 
you know, uh, through negative amortization, they might end up having more debt later. Um, and that's how it was kind of framed in the media and in, even in a lot of policy debates about student debt. And I think one thing that Benaba and I have really been trying to do is like, that's that's almost thinking about, uh, that's a, that's basically a white lens of, of thinking about student debt is, you, you know, your white doctors who are, um, you know, making a lot of money. But in the reality of the case is even though the people struggling to repay their loans, typically aren't, at least when you look at like white folks, the same people who have high amounts of debt. For black borrowers, they're overrepresented in both groups. That is, black borrowers have way more debt, just as Fenema said, but also much more difficulty paying that debt down. Um, and, you know, you could think about the default rates in terms of, you know, if we look at four-year college graduates, so these are the folks we might say, hey, these folks did everything right. They got a college degree. They kind of have their meal ticket to the middle class. If you look at white folks, maybe 3% are defaulting on their loans, like 12 years out of college, virtually nothing, basically. Um, one in five black borrowers who graduate from a four-year college are defaulting on their loans, even after they've gotten that. So that is this idea that college, going to college and graduating, and this is paying off and giving us access to financial stability and security, seems to be true for white folks. But in an era where we're um, sort of debt financing higher education, it doesn't seem to be as true for black folks. Wow. Okay, well, those are very, very important differences. Um, how did how did this occur? What are what are some of the mechanisms by which this um, awful bias appeared in uh, black student loans? Is it mostly due to black overrepresentation among students and for profits, or are there other factors we should consider? Um, so there are lots of uh, mechanisms or, or, or explanations as to what has been going on. Um, one thing that we can certainly point to, and, and some of them are better explained than others, that, that's, I'll just say that. One is has been the defunding of higher education at the state level. Um, so that we see this cost shift uh, or privatization. There's many different ways that you, uh, you, you can refer to it, um, where the cost of college has increasingly been, uh, was subsidized more uh, by the uh, state and federal government. And um, that sh costs have shifted more to students and their families. And as we've seen um, growth in the number of people that are pursuing higher education and more, and also uh, growth in the racial representation or the diversification of, uh, by race uh, at higher education, we've seen uh, increasingly the percent of that they've had to uh, carry or the cost that they've had to carry um, pushed onto these families that just don't have the socioeconomic or the economic resources to afford um, the cost, the overall cost of college. So tuition, fees, room and board, whatever, you know, all the, the costs, not just always tuition, you know, but also a lot of the associated um, costs with uh, completing a college degree being shifted to students and families um, at a time. And, and, and financial aid packages becoming less grant based or, or, or should I say grant based and, and more loan based. Um, we can speak to the Pell, the Pell Grant, which didn't keep up with inflation. So over time, which was, uh, you know, the grant program that was supposed to increase representation of lower uh, socio, a lower uh, uh, socioeconomic status uh, students within higher education, um, them also <laughs> um, taking on debt to complete their degrees, right? So something that was supposed to prevent them from going into uh, into into debt, um, uh, increasingly having to turn to credit markets to to make up the difference between the cost of college and what they uh, were supposed to or are supposed to to, to contribute as well. Um, so all big things, Jason. Did I did I leave anything out there? I think that's right. I would just, I mean, I know this audience is very a higher education focused audience. And so, you know, you are all really familiar with the defunding of higher education. Um, and we can pin that on Reagan or we cannot. It's everyone's favorite boogeyman here. But, um, you know, the defunding of ha higher education really happened at a time when colleges were becoming more diverse racially on campus. And as my our colleague Laura Hamilton argues, this diversity came without funding. Right. And that's a big part of the story. And then we could get into how that, like Fenimal was saying, how that financing was then shifted to families and then what that meant for a lot of black families who lacked the wealth and the socioeconomic standing and how we even think about things like wealth. And, you know, for example, white families who might tap into their home equity to help um, send junior to college, you know, black families historically don't have that wealth. And so wealth, um, which is really rooted in these historical in injustices of racism in the U.S. are really, I think for us, like a big, big part of the story. Um, and for us also are reproducing racial disparities in wealth among this generation of folks. That's a 
thank you. This is, uh, uh, you can see friends why I had to invite these um, two professors to our, to our program. Um, that last point, especially Professor Lula, about having the uh, reinscription and perhaps expansion of racial disparities through higher education is especially uh, brutal uh, and, and vital. Uh, I was about to exhort all of you to ask questions, and I'm going to do that. But before I even finish saying that, before I can even start saying that, questions have piled up. So let me just start putting them on the screen so you all get a chance to uh, to hear them all. Uh, and, and this I one want to interrupt. Sorry, sorry, can I interrupt one more? I didn't want to ignore. I didn't want to ignore your for-profit comment because I think of like Tressie Cottom's work as being some of the most important work on for-profits. And so for us, for-profits are part of the story, but they can't explain all of it. But they're they are particularly predatory and particularly alarming. I would say that's where the greatest pain really is. And so I think Tressie's book remains sort of undefeated in that regard and its ability to understand this. This is the uh, excellent book, Lower Ed, uh, which uh, I, I teach in my classes and I recommend to everybody. We've also read it in our book club and I can't recommend it enough. Thank you for echoing that. Uh, this is a question from uh, that we have from uh, Charles Finley. Um, oops, hang on a second. Uh, and Charles asks, I'm wondering what is the correlation between degree completion and debt accumulation and repayment? Yeah, so, um, so I'll, I'll speak for uh, the focus of our group for black borrowers. So what we find is that independent of degree completion, black student borrowers have significant amounts of debt, right? So that was a, a strong predictor of whether or not they had debt. Um, so black borrowers, non-completers, black borrowers with two year, four year degrees and grad students, I see some comments in the in, um, in the chat about grad student debt as well, all, all um, being correlated with student debt accumulation. Um, we do also know that non-completers struggle the most with repayment. So as Jason was making that distinction about the differences in the debt distribution. So there are a lot of people who are concentrated at the lower ends of the debt distribution with you know, like less than 10,000 amounts of debt. A lot of those people are among the people with who don't have the college degree. So they have the debt and no degree and they struggle, when we say struggle, you know, have um, a history of default and delinquency um, and mm. they're sharp and overrepresented amongst those people who are struggling the most. Um, so it's those little bits and amounts of debt, but we can also, uh, we, we, they are more likely to also be debt burdened. So, right, the amount of debt that they have relative to their income um, is, is quite large. I'll just add like two points to that. So um, I think to answer the question directly sort of out broadly, the correlation between degree completion and debt accumulation and repayments, like we know that, you know, kind of broadly speaking, people who complete their college degree, these folks tend to accumulate more debt, which makes sense because they're sort of going to college longer, right? But they have very little trouble repaying it. Non-completers accumulate less on average, but um, they're much, they have a much harder time repaying it going back to that discussion that I mentioned before. Like a lot of folks who are defaulting have very little loan levels and in part because they're having a hard time in the labor market finding jobs, high paying jobs. Um, yeah. But I want to also stress that, which I think Feneba stressed again, but I, I always feel like it's worth bears repeating everything because that's I always tell people that's 90 percent of my job as a professor is repeating myself. Um, that's really not enough to explain the racial disparity. So there's been some really good work on this. And so um, we have a piece in the Chronicle that's like an, uh, basically the introduction and first chapter of our book. But essentially what the research tends to show on this is that race is actually a stronger predictor of default than college completion. Like it explains as much variance in default as college completion does. And we see these massive racial disparities even among completers and non-completers. So while that might be part of the story about like risk of dropping out of college, when we think about the racial gaps in student loan debt, it's certainly not all, or even I think maybe kind of a, I can say the majority of the story. Yeah. Yeah. So race is a stronger predictor of student debt default than non-completion of degree. Or it's about as, it's, uh, sorry, it's about as, it explains as much variance, just about. Yes. They both explain around 20-ish percent of the variance. Each. Okay, um, thank you, thank you. And Charles, thank you for that question. Uh, if you're new to the forum, by the way, that's an example of a text question. Uh, you can see how it works. Uh, meanwhile, in the chat, we had a couple of really good comments from um, Ed Webb and Ariana Curtis about uh, how tuition is not the entire picture of costs um, for uh, students. Uh, which is uh, very, very true and, and definitely worth report, repeating. Now that we've had a text question, uh, let's bring up a video question and I'll just have uh, Lynn Sibolsky join us. 
Let's see if we can bring her up on stage. And hello, Lynn. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Very well. Thank you. Excellent. It's always a win. Um, yes. Wild horses could not have dragged me away from today's presentation. So thank you uh -huh. to the presenters for this work. Um, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, I just wanted to make a comment and then ask the question. Um, my comment, I'm thinking back to my very first job in financial aid that was on the school side versus in student loan servicing. And that was as the director of financial aid for a for-profit medical assistant school, predominantly black students. And unbeknownst to me, it was already being shut down for Title IV violations. Um, oh. And I regard my year and a half at that institution as one of, if not the most pivotal um, extended moments in my life in terms of learning what I did not understand as a white person born and raised in coal country, Northeast Pennsylvania, 18702, um, coming from a place that was problematic, you know, having moved out to New York City and saying, hey, I'm, I'm here to embrace all of the things that the world has to offer. But what that job taught me in terms of working with that student population were advantages that I took for granted, even as the child of, um, you know, a, a first in college father. Um, my students didn't have homes, you know, and it made a big difference in terms of did they have you know, a meal to eat? Did they have a place to do their homework? Did they have money for the Metro card the next day? Was a parent going to be around to fill out their piece of the FAFSA so that they could finally get that loan money so that they could get that stipend for their transportation and so on and so forth? Um, you know, the, the issues of trauma that required professional judgment, that required reaching out to other people in the community to confirm some of just the terrible experiences that some of these students went to, um, you know, in and out of class because they're in and out of homelessness, um, you know, kids bringing guns to the school. I mean, I could, I could go on forever, but it, just in terms of understanding what that student population was up against, to this day, I still feel terrible about all of the student loans that I signed off on and the financial aid packages because I have so much of a better understanding of what really happened to those students, whether or not they graduated from the program and how easily they were taken advantage of because they just didn't have, you know, the background and the resources and support that even someone like me took for granted. And so my question going forward with the advent of technology, now that students can take classes online, knowing that you know my black colleagues feel better going to work working from home versus attending in person what are the implications of that for this population in terms of you know hey we're going to go online shopping for some schools that are cheaper we won't have to take out as much in student loans but is it a fly by night thing and is that a space the online space given um you know just racial tensions is that a space that we should be focusing on or is there a real disadvantage to putting the focus on online education? Oh, wow. <laughs> do you want to start? Do you want to start? Do you start? Um, I mean, I have some thoughts. I, 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 Jason, feel free to jump in whenever. Um, I guess my, my initial thought, I, I actually honestly thought you were going to ask a different question, so I'm recalibrating. Um, because uh, thinking about um, what we know about online courses, there's a lot a lot of the, the work that has been done on that was prior to COVID, right? So we have, you know, th there's still a lot of work that's in progress of like what online teaching and online environment, of course, of course that's conflated with COVID as well as what happened, you know, the events that happened, especially in the spring and summer of 2020 with regard to a lot of the um, mass murders and, uh, and, and killings of, of black men and women. Um, uh, so I think um, I'm saying all that to say is that um, what we know about in, in the past, especially with regard to online degrees and even like they, they tended to be um, predatory. They didn't, there was a lot, a lot of evidence that the returns to, to a lot of those degrees and programs were equivalent to um, 
some of the non-online programs um, and traditional institutional programs or how they were evaluated and seen, um, especially within the labor market. So I'm starting there to say that um, when we try to think, and, and, I, and I think this moment is definitely a moment where we should be thinking innovatively and thinking about what else could we do, you know, beyond what we've always done. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're um, creating products and creating returns with equity, and, you know, uh, with an equity focus, and and our and our um, ensuring that they're not recreating uh, inequalities, and 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 so that would be where I, where I would would go with that question. Um, I think, um, and, and so what we saw a lot, especially like with the for-profits is these kind of predatory um, actors who preyed on the most vulnerable, um, in, in particular black borrowers um, in particular. Um, and so a lot of like, you know, I'll, I'll give an example, like black women are overwhelmingly, are overwhelmingly <laughs> represented within for-profits because they, uh, they meet a need, right? For women who are working, maybe women with, with small children, um, the ability to kind of have flexible schedules. Um, but you know, enormous amounts of debt that these these uh, that the, a lot of these women um, accumulated by um, pursuing those types or, or by attending those types of institutions and getting degrees from those those places. And then when you turn to the labor market, not being amply compensated or being questioned about the quality of those degrees. That's just that's just one example. Thank you. That's a great answer uh, for a powerful question, Professor Hull. Did you want to weigh in? Um, well, I always like to say when I'm sort of outside of my wheelhouse and expertise, when it comes to online education, I'm decidedly out of my expertise. Although, you know, like the rest of us, I just spent the last two and a half years of my life uh, learning how to do online education poorly. So um, I, I think I would just echo what Fenaba said, is it sort of depends what it looks like. I know my own um, institution has now kind of said, well, we can't always do stuff online. We are not accredited for this. So you see a lot of institutions kind of backing off for this on, from this online focus. But I think it really depends what, these, what a lot of quote unquote nonprofit institutions do with this new kind of like online technology they have. Do they turn like a part of their campus into something that looks very much like a for-profit university? Or do they use that new online technology and online infrastructure to actually give us education that is more affordable and can be accessed more easily? Um, I, I'm a little bit pessimistic as to what the answer to that question is. It's probably more the former than the latter, but I think it really depends on where we go in the next five to 10 years, I think, I would guess. Well, um, Lynn, thank you so much for that question. Um, did you want to say more to build on that or? Oh, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm ready to sit back and listen now. <laughs> well, I think you're fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Um, friends, again, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question, as you might have guessed. Uh, so please, if you'd like to uh, follow Lynn and joining us on stage, just click the raised hand button. Or if you'd like to uh, follow Charles and ask a text question, just type in that, you know, hit that Q&A box and, and fill her up. Uh, we've got more and more questions coming. And by the way, thank you, um, uh, Jason and Fanabo. That, that, those are terrific, terrific answers. And, and if I could, much as I like to make fun of Dartmouth and New Hampshire, Dartmouth has long been a leader in digital technology. Uh, Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth Congress is where the term artificial intelligence came from. Uh, there's a, a lot of great stuff there, a lot of great people. But let me get out of the way and, and bring up some questions. Uh, we have a, a, a detailed question, a sociological question from our wonderful friend, Roxanne Riskin, who asks, I find that family members like parents and grandparents often take on student debt for family members. What are your findings and views in this area? I, I guess I'll just say the findings are everything we talk about in our book is racial disparities being massive. Multiply that by some math, other huge factor. And that's what we're talking about with parents and grandparent borrowing. So plus loans have really taken off in the last um, 10, 15 years. And you see a huge uh, proportion, a growing proportion of plus loans that are now in the six figure territory. So we're seeing this a lot. Like we talked to a lot of folks uh, who we talked to for this book who were like, yeah, my parents and my grandparents took on some loans for me to the key of like, you know, this student may have taken on 30, 40 grand. Their parents were in it for 70, 80, 90 grand. Uh, you know, not being any loan limits for PLUS loans, that's a big deal. It's also why this loan forgiveness package, even though PLUS loans might be eligible, isn't gonna do as much to move the needle there. We don't have as much data on plus loans, but I would say I would venture a guess that the racial disparities we have, that Feneba and I are observing in our work and that others are observing too are much, much, much bigger for plus loans. 
Wow. And I, can I, I'll just add that um, we actually spent some time in the book. So I think it's chapter three, chapter two and chapter three, like when we go into the background of uh, a lot of the people that we spoke with and, and talking about the background of how that like essentially what we kind of think of as the debt accumulation piece, the story is not a story of individuals. It's a story of families, of, of, of families wanting to figure out a way to make college happen for their children. And so we've had lots of, in the, in the course of writing the book, we, we had lots of different terms. One was um, all hands on deck. I think that was one of the things we, we, we floated and um, um, just, just thinking about how, and, and hearing from our respondents, how it really became making a way out of no economic way <laughs> to make this happen. And, and, and even when they tried a lot, of, and, and oftentimes a lot of times when our respondents tried to avoid taking on loans, it became increasingly difficult one not to, um, to to avoid them, and then parents taking on the loans to try to prevent their children from going into excessive debt as well. So I'm going to make a plug for the book if you want. To, you know that we really go into this, this family, the ideas of how families worked together to try to make college happen for their for their children. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add here to build on what Feniba would say is that like it's partially a story about what parents and grandparents or families are doing to get ch their children to college or their family members to college. But once there, a lot of these young people in college are then taking on debt and maybe getting a refund check or working and then sending money back home to help their parents who are now cash strapped because why? Because they've taken on all this debt to send them to college. And so there really is this feedback. It's not just flowing from grandparents and parents to children, but it works the other way as well. <clears throat> Roxanne, thank you for that great question, and, and thank you both for, for this answer. That's a very this is a story not of individuals but of families. Wow, um, this is huge. Uh, we have more questions coming in, and uh, I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask. Uh, we have two um, uh, kind of information or clarification questions from our good friend uh, Glenn McGee. Uh, first, this is a question for you. Um, Professor Hull, can you share the five by five mobility matrix that you use? How does it compare across races? Um, I guess I'm a, I don't think I have a five by five. I, I don't, I guess I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding the question. I used to do kind of traditional social mobility work way back in the day in grad school. That doesn't mm -hmm. really factor into this research. Um, mobility tables are a bit old school, but it's, um, you know, for lack of a better term, that, that's sort of my, my former self did a lot of sort of traditional social mobility contingency table analysis. Um, but I don't think that really comes up in, in these, in this book uh, in particular. Okay, thank you. Uh, and he also follows up with a quick question. Uh, are you uh, tying this work with uh, Viviana Zelzer's work with Black Dead? And Viviana Zelzer is new to me, so I, I don't... She... Uh... Yeah, she's a sociologist, uh, I believe, at Princeton, um, or she's been there for quite some time. Uh, does a lot of work about the value of money or about the, um, mm. you know, the transit values of, 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 of within society. Um, so she's a uh, economic sociologist, if I'm correct. Um, I would say um, we probably engage some, some some of her ideas, but really uh, we think about we're also tying in work by like Louise, Louise Simster as well, who's made some distinctions between um, black wealth and white, uh, white <laughs> black debt and white debt as well. There's lots of, um, you know, one of the, the great things about being in this space is that not only has it um, been, not only has it prolifer has grown quite a bit over the last few years, but a lot of um, uh, new ideas and bringing in, uh, incorporating a lot of new um, ways of thinking about uh, the role of debt within our society, and especially the racialization of this debt, um, which mm -hmm. Louise's uh, black black debt, white debt um, work is really speaks to how white, um, especially wealthier people, have been able to use debt to make more to become wealthier, and how debt. Um, um, for Black uh, families has been um, a way to kind of um, position them position them lower uh, in the, at the lower ends of the wealth distribution. So just becoming something that keeps them impoverished and indebted. Um, so um, I think that's slightly different than thinking about the um, the way that Zelizer uh, has 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 thought about these. But I know uh, Jason. I know I'm, I'm I'm kind of thinking also maybe a little bit about. The work on like relational debt 
Is, is, some, is that? Yeah, some that? I think of Zelizer's work as very much being like squarely in the social meaning meaning of money and sort of thinking yeah. about these things as relational processes, which is a super valuable way to think about it. And we actually do have some of this in our book because there's, um, oh God, I'm blanking on their names and I feel terrible about it. Um, but there's some folks who've done work on debt among law students that talk about like sort of the relational work that it creates. Um, Berman? You mean, are you Berman? Yeah. Are you uh, Berman? Uh, yeah, Elizabeth Pop Berman and um, the first author on that paper, I am blanking on their name and I feel horrible uh, about it. Um, but we do have a little bit of that in the book. It's sort of like these are some of the burdens that debt creates as it causes Abby, all the Abby. relational work. Ab yeah, Abby Stivers, yes. Um, but I would say if you want someone who's really taking Zellerzer's ideas and applying them to debt in like the most interesting way, since that's sort of not our background, check out Frederick Weary, uh, Weary's work, also a professor at Princeton. He's very much kind of in that Zellerzerian um, sort of uh, uh, sort of world, if you will. Yeah. Um, I just shared a, a link to, um, let's see, Black Debt, White Debt um, uh, Seamster. Louise Seamster, is that it? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a link to one article by her in the in the chat, um, and that's Frederick Wary uh, at Social. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Glenn just nodding at the, the. I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat and nodding, so people will think that I. <laughs> what is she doing? I'm just following along the the the, the chat. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you do. Um, the the chat is really really active, uh, and Glenn has a, a, a incredibly broad knowledge of. Uh, of uh, sociology literature going back a ways. Um, we also have um, more questions coming in. Uh, and here's one from our good friend, Tom Ames, uh, who asks a question about institutional types. Uh, why are more of these families leveraging community colleges and more cost-effective options? Is the lack of institutional flexibility to meet their needs? Do you want to say, I don't know, Jason, are you going to? Uh, I mean, I guess I can, I can start like, you know, you know, I think we could think of part of this story, like you, it might be tempting to think of this story of like as sort of like an education, an educational mismatch story. Like people are kind of making the bad, like wrong decisions about where to go to college. Um, and I, I just, I haven't found like an explanation there that, that, seems like to hold water in the data to me. Again, when we look at racial disparities, we see them at community colleges, at for-profits, at four years, um, even at places like Dartmouth. Um, I'd hate to say it. Um, so we're seeing these everywhere. And one thing that we kind of, you know, we're quantitative researchers, so we're always crunching the numbers and all that stuff. But one thing that this book kind of opened our eyes about when we sat down and like, you know, talked to a lot of borrowers is people agonized over what the right decision to make was. Where should I go to school? That is, a lot of people were staying in, in, in state and maybe starting at a community college or starting at a place where they could stay at home and save a little money. Um, and you know they blamed themselves at the end for making the wrong decision, when in reality, we really see these disparities kind of regardless of where people are going. So from our, our sort of more broader perspective, it's the, the sort of individual choice question it's it's one that is hard for me to sort of think of as like as an answer to this. It's sort of maybe if people just made better decisions, there wouldn't be these racial disparities. And I think that's sort of the central thesis of our book is that's not the case, I think is, is how I would think about it. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Tom, for the good question. Uh, and uh, friends, we are coming up to the last quarter of the hour. Uh, so I wanna make sure if you have any thoughts uh, any comments, this is the time to really get them in. Uh, uh, we have a, a comment from uh, Jordan Davis, who is a wonderful person, among other things, uh, a great student at uh, Georgetown, where I teach. And uh, I'm just going to bring this up from the, uh, from the chat box. Um, he says, the thing is that a lot of black students who attend community college don't have a finishing, so choosing those cheaper options doesn't really help the issue because cheaper options are not necessarily better options per se. Yeah. So, thank you. Better than I put it. <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, there's an exchange between uh, Lisa and David. Uh, Lisa different David Ron. Uh, Lisa asks, shouldn't the first uh, of the list, I think, be what I want to be in life? And David's response is yes, and will provide a family sustaining wage. Uh, so, as usual, the forum community is is bouncing ideas around very very quickly and. Uh, from a wide range of perspectives and domains. Uh, we have a question that came early on, and I think this is a good time to bring it up. 
Um, this is from John Hollenbeck up in Wisconsin. Uh, and John asks flat out, isn't debt the new slavery, especially those who borrow but do not get a degree? What incentive did they have for fixing this? And I think John can correct me, but the quotes around they means the institution or uh, society in general, not the students. Here, I'll put that back up. It's a good question, though, so you can see it. Thanks, I mean, I don't think that that's very far off from ways that we have seen debt kind of uh, I, I keep saying the word position, but but kept yeah. Black Americans um, at the lower ends of the uh, socioeconomic distribution across generations, right? We have slavery, we have um, sharecropping, which is like debt peonage. I mean, just it's, you know, inequality in new forms, right? And so Jason and I call uh, student loan debt a new stratifier because it is concentrated among recent cohorts of young adults. Um, but what is it really doing? It's recreating economic inequality within our society that positions uh, black families um, at the lower ends of the of, of the wealth and, and, and income <laughs> distribution as well um, uh, um, what we're seeing you know as we're seeing today um, I was gonna say something else but I, I think yeah I'll, I'll, I'll pause there for now if Jason wants to add something um, I would just add that like that's not an invalid argument in the social sciences and thinking about debt right now and if you kind of want to see that argument taken to its logical conclusion I would really yeah. recommend this great book by my colleagues Kevin Light and Scott Scott Fitzgerald um, if there's two different versions of the book one is called middle class meltdown but the one that actually gets to your uh, question the first edition of that book actually has a different title and it's called post-industrial peasants basically saying like um sort of like working class and middle class folks who are saddled with debt are not unlike peasants who were or serfs who were tied to the land in sort of feudal times um that's their argument and i would say if you want to see that argument taken to its logical conclusion it's a really wonderful thought-provoking book i don't know that i'm brave enough to call that the new slavery personally but i think if you want to see that argument they do an excellent job kind of enumerating sort of the logic behind it and the evidence for it well, thank you. Those are two great titles, by the way. Uh, yeah. Middle class meltdown, post industrial peasants. I, I put a link to uh, Goodreads on that. Poor fellow's real name is Scott Fitzgerald. Oh, man. Um, I hope I didn't get his first name wrong and it just came up because I was thinking Fitzgerald. It is, it is Scott. It is Scott. Um, uh, and there's also uh, uh, in the chat, uh, we had um, uh, a, a link to one of my favorite recent books, David Graeber, the late David Graeber's book on uh, debt. Um, we seem to have quite a bibliography coming out of this. But uh, we also have a great video question. You mentioned Jordan Davis, and now he's, it's his time for the spotlight. So let me bring him up on stage. Hello, Jordan. Hey, Brian. Hey, Professor um, Addo and Professor uh, Hul. Good to see you all. Thank you so much for, for joining today. And uh, I, I'm really glad to be a part of this conversation. I, read, I, I wrote a paper for one of my classes last year. Um, about um, this exact subject, so I'm like really engaged. And I get, the the question that I have is actually about making college more affordable and potentially making college free in the U.S. Um, is that a conversation that like how close are we to that conversation being proliferated on a national level? Like who is talking? Is anybody talking about that? And um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that would be complicated by that. But I'm, I'm just curious, has, is, are there any organizations, politicians talking about, you know, making college more affordable and, and potentially free in the future? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> there are. There are lots of conversations, I'll say. More so um, at the state level, state, um, if, if we're looking at uh, public institutions, um, it's very highly state dependent on where you are and where, you know, uh, whether or not your state is doing more innovative things with uh, with higher education. If they're offering these, let's say, like um, we've seen a proliferation of these promise uh, promise or promise packages, which are non-merit financial aid based kind of uh, uh, programs as opposed to merit based aid um, programs that are um, we have Michigan, Tennessee. I mean, they're just everywhere. Even North Carolina has one, Wisconsin had one while I was there um, as well. 
So, um, I, I, and though these are all programs that are meant to make it more affordable for low income um, uh, 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 families to, to send their children through these, through these institutions. I'll also say that, you know, what we also find um, is that some of the most innovative financial aid uh, is happening at private institutions. So, or is like, when I say innovative, I mean places where uh, students can go and kind of, oh, low income students can go and leave without a lot of debt or, or, or with no, no debt. Uh, the problem is, is that as they become more innovative in their financial aid uh, packages, they haven't really increased the number of students that they are admitting, right? So they're, they're, these are the highly selective institutions that we can think of the Ivies or you know small uh, uh, selective liberal arts colleges as well. So if you are lucky enough or you know are able to get into one of these institutions and you're low income, um, it, it is highly likely that you may uh, be able to. Uh, to, 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 to leave with reduced debt or, or little to no debt. Um, that being said, like Jason has said earlier, you know, there's still uh, a high correlation between still going to these institutions and, and having debt, but the, the, that's really where we see kind of more of the like innovative um, uh, financial affordability uh, programs happening, it's, except they're not open to all students. <laughs> they're, you know, you have to, you have to get in, yeah. Yeah, going to a school with a huge endowment makes a difference um, and they have the money to kind of be experimental, as Venema said. But, you know, I think, you know, if you told me 10 years ago that debt forgiveness would be a central platform of the Democratic Party, I would have told you you were nuts. If you get if you said that bet ten thousand dollars, I'd be like, I'll take that bet, whatever. And then now it is. And I think we're seeing free college, just as Venema said, we're seeing it at the state level. and. The state level, the devil's in the details. Like, is it first dollar? Is it last dollar? Some ways of doing these free college programs seem to work better than others. We talk about this a lot in the conclusion of our book. But on the national uh, sort of level, we are seeing it. So I think it was when Bernie Sanders was running in 2020. That was part of his platform. I, forgive me, but I don't remember if this was part of Elizabeth Warren's platform or not. Um, if you want to kind of read like sort of a techie, wonky policy brief on like, how would we make this work given how we fund higher education? That is, how could we make college free or the first two years of college free, you know, without, um, you know, dump, uh, without spending more money? Because that's always, you know, a non-starter at the federal level, right? Um, there's a really great white paper by Sarah Goldrick Rabb and Nancy Kendall called FC20, which that was really the paper that launched. I mean, I think it was that paper and all the, everything that came after it that sort of became Bernie's platform here. So I think this is becoming part of a national conversation. And again, 10 years from now, maybe this is looking very different, just like debt forgiveness. And um, not to switch the subject too much, but if we are start, starting to talk about debt forgiveness as this, and I would say important downstream solution to the student debt crisis, we better be looking at upstream solutions like affordable or free college, because if not, we're gonna find ourselves right back to where we started five or 10 years from now, even after this forgiveness is up. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't agree more. I was just about to echo the last, the very last sentiment you just made, and you made it for me. So, so thank you so much. I saw somebody in the chat too talk about uh, uh, credentialing inflation and like how mm -hmm. credentialism would increase as a result of more people going to college. And I think that's a whole another part of the conversation that deserves unpacking. But I'll let someone else, you know, ask their questions mm -hmm. and share the spotlight. So thank you so much. Uh, thank for you. Answering. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Um, Great question and a great answer. Um, we have uh, we have a bunch of comments that are just coming up and down the, uh, the chat right now. So uh, I can save that. And if, and if people in the chat don't mind, uh, I could post it to, uh, to my blog along with a recording. So if you're chatting right now, if you don't want me to post this, please let me know. Uh, I can also anonymize it and just remove your names. Uh, so just let me know in the chat. Um, we have all kinds of questions to, uh, to to bring up, and we're starting to run low on time. So I want to make sure that we get um, we get uh, to the ones that we that have come in earlier. John Hollenbeck uh, asks, he, he returns to his first question, and he wants to press on this a little further. Who would free tuition, I'm sorry, who would free college benefit? I doubt it's, quote, them, unquote. Um, so that's a good question. I, I guess that's another way of saying, what are, the, what are the politics of this? How could that work? Yeah, I mean, my understanding of most free college programs and even the federal, um, what's going on at the federal level, it's a proposal to make the first two years of public uh, of college free at the public level. So, you know, this wouldn't affect the Dartmouths of the world. This wouldn't affect the Stanfords of the world, the Dukes of the world. So, um, 
I suspect that a lot of people would not necessarily, a lot of wealthier folks wouldn't necessarily take advantage of it, which could also be why we see political blowback to this in the same way we're seeing political blowback for debt forgiveness. So, um, in fact, one of the Republican challenges to the new debt forgiveness law is basically, and I think it came out of Wisconsin actually, is that um, this disproportionately benefits black folks and therefore it's racially motivated and therefore this should be struck down. Um, all these legal challenges and they're all trying to prove that they've injured their defendant in some way because they have to do that. Um, but I suspect we would probably have these same conversations because these are the conversations we've had for a hundred years over any social program that might benefit anyone in, in, in society that is, um, yeah. We, uh, years ago, we hosted uh, uh, Chris Newfield on the forum. Yeah who's done several great books on the defunding of public universities. And he makes the case that the defunding started in California mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s, specifically in response to the growing diversity of the student body. Um, we have, um, uh, well, let me put it another way. Another question asked, we've been, we've been talking about the, the Biden forgiveness plan. I'm, I'm wondering if we could hypothetically make a scenario where if the debt forgiveness plan succeeds, it survives legal challenges, it survives logistical hunt, and all, it, it manages to progress. Say five years out, how does that impact the student debt situation overall? Do you think the student debt bubble reinflates? Do you think this will adjust the uh, preponderance of debt that uh, black students disproportionately have? I mean, how, how might that play out, do you think? I guess I mean, starting from where Jason kind of just left off, you know, if we just think of downstream instead of fixing the upstream, such as um, in particular the accumulation part, then we could very much see us back in the same place uh, where we are, <laughs> where we are today. Um, you know, in particular, thinking about how, um, well, I, I'll say, um, um, what hasn't changed is the, the the need or, and tying in the credentialing discussion um, uh, for a college degree in order to achieve some so, some form of financial or economic security within our society right so um, it's not clear to me that um, people are are changing their risk profile as a result as as as, as a result of the of the student debt cancellation because not having the college degree um, is is um, um, yeah. It makes it hard to, in, in the labor in the market. So I'll, yeah. I'll just say that that there. I also, um, yeah. So we so we really need to think about, you know, at least multiple places that need <laughs> need reform, um, and in particular the accumulation and the afford debt, of the affordability piece. Um, I also say that you know, I'm a part of the camp that thought that while the 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 plan was a great start, it was definitely not an end, right? And so um, there were a lot of um, in particular, black borrowers who were not going to be able to meet or were not going to fit the criteria, right? So they may have, um, because of their income, may not qualify for debt forgiveness. You know, they may have over $150,000 um, and so forth, will, will not be receiving any, any relief, but they don't have the wealth profiles, right? <laughs> um, or they're still struggling with or paying massive amounts of debt. Um, um, and so thinking about, you know, who, you know, this, um, it's going to help a lot of people, but not all the borrowers. And I really would like to see more done for the people who are still have lots of outstanding debt and just don't have uh, the economic profile to 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 to, to improve uh, to improve and pay and pay off that massive amounts of debt um, that they hold. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Then Thank I would you. add, I guess, a couple more things is because I just want to, again, this is sort of plugging what we say in the last chapter of the book, but I just also wanted to point out, if you're interested in sort of a more wonky back of the envelope, how much debt forgiveness would we need to kind of like eliminate racial disparities in debt? Two papers I really like by Charlie Eaton, Adam Goldstein, and Laura Hamilton. That was basically uh, a paper that informed some of Elizabeth Warren's stuff as well as uh, Tom Shapiro, Louise Sam Seamster, and Raphael uh, Sharon Chenier both kind of show that these sort of smaller debt forgiveness things like ten, twenty thousand dollars, which is what we got, are going to move the needle, but not as much as fifty thousand or full forgiveness. In part because black borrowers have these huge balances, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's part of it. So this is going to make a dent. It's not going to be a silver bullet, 
The second thing is like what you said, like what happens five years from now, like sort of what Feneva said, I'm probably, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a glass half empty guy because I'm a sociologist. So by definition, I sort of am pessimistic, but I worry about where we will be from for five or 10 years from now. Um, my colleague, Charlie Eaton has a really good piece in the AAUP newsletter um, this week in Academe today, I think it's called, where he basically argues what this could do. And he takes a real Graeber style argument for those of you who like Graeber. Um, that this could be the start of a virtuous cycle where we're going to see repeat debt jubilee, sort of like we did in the Middle Ages. I, 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 like, I, I love Charlie, and I hope he's right, but I, I'm not as optimistic about that. But that is one way we could continue to be out of this, is, and we're good at that as Americans, is to keep fixing downstream problems without addressing the root causes. So I guess that's a possibility as well, and some people think it really is. Well. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, both of you. We, we are at the end of our hour. We've actually overshot it a bit because we have so much to talk about. Um, thank you both for offering such a fantastic masterclass in, in this topic. Um, I'm, I'm just in awe of how much, how much knowledge you, you've not just accumulated and shared, but shared so elegantly and so passionately. Thank you both. What's, what's the best way to keep up with both of you? As uh, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated. Uh, Professor Otto, about your paper on, on student debt reparation, for example. How do we keep up with all of you? Um, you can find me. I'm the only, I think I'm the only Finneba Otto out there. So if you just Google my name, but I'm here at UNC Chapel Hill on most days. Most days I'm, 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 I'm in, uh, you can find me in the classroom or in my office around UNC. Sounds good. You can see me at jnhool.org. That's my website. And also, there's not many Jason Hools out there, so I'm pretty easy to follow on Google Scholar. Because um, Fenneba and I have been writing about student debt for well over a decade now, and we're, we're very kind of happy to see people caring about it a lot more than when we started this work uh, when we were grad students, when people seemed less interested in talking about it. Um, and I'm one of those people who quit Twitter in the pandemic, so you can't find me there. Oh. <laughs> well, we'll have to find you where we can. Um, Thank you both, and um, uh, this is important work, and we really look forward to where this goes next. Um, but I, I have to wrap things up, but thank you again. Uh, thank you both. Um, and friends, um, don't leave yet. Uh, we have uh, just information on what's happening next. Um, we have uh, coming up over the next few weeks, we have a whole series of uh, sessions. Um, if you wanna keep talking about student debt and the racial dimension of this, uh, please, on Twitter, if you still are on Twitter, use FTTE as a hashtag. Uh, you can follow me, Brian Alexander, or Shindig Events, or you could go to my blog, brianalexander.org. If you'd like to uh, look ahead a bit, uh, we have, or if you'd like to look into the past, rather, to our previous sessions on debt, as well as into race and racism, uh, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. You can see all of our sessions there. Um, looking ahead, we have more topics coming up, including free speech, redesigning universities, campuses and local inequality, and the impact of COVID in higher ed. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us if you'd like to see those. Uh, and if you want to share any of your own work, just email me. Uh, I'd be glad to share that uh, with everybody else. Now, thank you again. You all asked terrific questions. It's been wonderful talking with you. Thank you all for all of your work. As the fall semester goes on, please work hard. Be safe and take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.